Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service for Sunday the 14th of March. I would like to welcome you all again here to High Street, and we pray that God will bless us in this time of fellowship together. Just to again thank everyone for your continued, uh, continued prayerful support for the uh, work of our congregation. And just also to mention that your fellowship will be online tonight between 7 and 8 p.m. And parents can again email highstreetyouth at outlook.com to receive this link. And this, is also, this meeting is also for members of Bible class. Our next midweek uh, Zoom prayer meeting will be on Thursday the 18th of March. And if you send me an email at cmcdole at presbyterianireland.org, I will send you a link for that meeting. And the details are also on our website and our Facebook page. This is a, a very informal time together. We, had, we have just had a, a, a meeting on Thursday night past. Uh, it's an informal time. Just bring your cup of tea and coffee at the beginning. And we have fellowship together. We have a chat together. And then we share and uh, finish off with a time of prayer. And it should last between 30 and 40 minutes. These are all of our announcements today, and let us all worship God together. Our reading today for Lent is taken from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, and it will be read to us by Gail Carson. Today's Bible reading is taken from John 3, verses 14 to 21. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their, evil, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come into the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Amen. Thank you, Gail, and we pray that God will bless to each and every one of us this reading from his word. Let us all pray together. God of hope, your steadfast love endures forever. We give you thanks that time after time you break into the darkness of our world and of our lives with those signs of your everlasting love. You bring light, sometimes the merest flicker that brings us a focus, at other times a brightening glow, a glow that confronts us with that reality of your wonderful presence. Your love endures through all our doubts and confusion, persisting until we recognise those signs of hope that break through to remind us of your grace, revealing that divine spark in each of us as we were created in love. We thank you especially at this time for the skill of scientists and medics continuing to find ways to live in harmony with creation, harnessing the gifts that you have given to find protection from disease. Father, we thank you for all who put the needs of others before themselves, choosing to put another's welfare above their own comfort. We thank you for all whose work continues to ensure that the hungry are fed, the sick are healed, the homeless are sheltered, and the poor are cared for. Those who in their everyday lives show you at work in the world. May our giving thanks, O God, be manifest in our playing our part, where we can for the healing of our world, for love's sake. 
Forgive us, O God, when we forget your love for ourselves and for others. Forgive us when we hoard or discard resources out of the rich bounty that you have given. Forgive us when we fail to see our connectedness to you and to our neighbour. Father, bring us back to you time after time. Stop us in our tracks and confound us with love until worn down we fix our eyes on you, God of our salvation, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, this morning I want to tell you about Jesus. About Jesus and his disciples as they were getting ready for the Jewish festival of Passover. And you know, at this time Jesus knew that it was getting close to where he was going to leave that home that he had here on earth and to go back to heaven. And while they were together and while they were having a meal together, while they were having dinner together, Jesus had a lot of things in his mind. He knew that one of his friends was going to betray him. And he also knew that God had a plan and had everything under control. And after the dinner was finished, Jesus got up and he got some water and he started to wash his disciples' feet. And he came to Simon Peter and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said, no, he said, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered Peter, he said, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You see, it was usually only servants who washed people's feet. And Jesus was a king, the king of kings and lord of lords. And a king like that shouldn't be washing anyone's feet. But Jesus did this to teach his friends a lesson. You should help people. Everyone should be a servant and help the people around them. Whenever Jesus had finished washing their feet, he came back to the table and he said, Do you understand what, what I have done for you? He said, You call me teacher and Lord, and that is right for you to do because that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Because I tell you, no servant is greater than their master. There is a, nor is there a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And we know, don't we, that Jesus was the, the greatest person that ever lived. And yet, he wasn't too good to wash another person's feet. Now, we don't very often do this, do we? We don't very often wash another person's feet. But the question I want to leave with you today is this. What are some other ways that we can help out people in our lives? That's what we need to think about today. Amen. We're now going to read together from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verses 28 to 30. And let us all hear God's word together. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Amen. And we pray that God will bless to each and every one of us this reading from his word. Today we want to think together about 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And this is a promise that God gives to us. And this is a promise that we really do need to know about. Because what we know will change our perspective. And what is it that Paul tells us here? He said, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this is one of the most comforting and almost perspective-altering promises in the Bible. And today we need to ask ourselves three questions. How do we know this promise is true, first of all? Secondly, what is it that we can claim is true? And thirdly, how does this truth change our approach to living? So how, how do we know this is true, first of all? See, Paul makes this declaration that we know that God is working all things for the good. And it's a great sentiment, isn't it? It's something that we, that we really want to be true. However, how do we know that this promise is true? And let's face it, as we look around, it often appears that nothing good is happening. So if we can't know this promise is true by, by simply looking around, how do we conclude that it's true at all? Well, you know, I think the first reason we know it's true is because of the Bible, because of God's word. The Bible tells us that God is in control of the world and what happens in it. And time and again, we are told that God rules over all things. Remember those words from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 to 9, where Hannah, the mother of, Ham, the, the, the mother of Samuel, says this. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints. But the wicked will be silenced in darkness. And then in Daniel chapter 2 verses 20 to 22 the prophet Daniel says this. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. In Proverbs 16, 9, King Solomon writes these words. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. You see, God can alter any situation and, and produce any effect he so desires. Now, these passages do not tell us that God causes everything to happen but what they do tell us is that God has authority over everything he can use any circumstance in any way he chooses and there are hundreds of these kinds of verses scattered throughout the Bible they tell us that God is in control and in addition to these explicit statements you can see that truth illustrated by many examples in the Bible Think through the Bible about the stories of Abraham and Moses, Ruth, Tamar, David, Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Jonah, Daniel, Job, and so many more. And all of these people discovered that in spite of difficult times, God was working for their good and for his glory. And of course, the best example of this principle is Jesus. In spite of the bitter rejection, the cruel beatings, and the tragic death, God was working through these things for our good. The Bible also tells us that, that God loves us. In the verses that follow our text in Romans chapter 8, Paul makes this argument in verses 31 to 35. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? 
If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine or nakedness, or danger or sore? And the, argue is very, the argument is very simple. God has proved his love in giving us his son and giving us Jesus. And if God is in control, and he is, and since he has already invested heavily in us through his son, Jesus Christ, that proves his love. Then we need to know that God is not going to let anything happen to us that is outside the realm of his influence. But the second way that we know is by personal experience. See, our personal testimony is always the most potent testimony that we have. It may not be the most reliable testimony, but it is the most powerful testimony. And we do not have to look very far back into our lives to see a, a host of circumstances that just seem to work out. We can recount, can't we, many times when we said, I don't think I can make it through this. But we found a, a seemingly supernatural strength helping us. We can see that the times our faith grew the most was when the times and the circumstances were most difficult. We can look back and see that our hearts were enlarged because of our own times of suffering. We can know that God is working in and through our lives because of the promises of the Bible, because of the examples of the Bible, the evidence of God's love and also because of our own personal experience. But secondly, the morning I, this morning I want to ask this. What is it that we should know? What is it that we should know? But I want you to see here what the promise doesn't say. It's important that you read this promise in Romans 8 very carefully. We must not make it say more than it does. Paul does not tell us that all things are good. You know, there are many things in this life that are not good. The Bible never implies that war or disease or abuse or injustice or tragedy. The Bible never implies that abusive government regime, abusive government regimes and so forth are good things. They are evil things. The Bible does not tell us that everything is good. You see, to us, Good is that which is easy or pleasant and satisfying. It is, if it was up to us, we would never have to go through any kind of physical training. We would never have to take an exam or write a dissertation. We would certainly never have to go through labour or, or surgery of any kind. We define good by what is most pleasant for the moment. And God defines good as that which moves us in the direction of Christ-likeness and prepares us for heaven. I want you to see here that there's also a condition in this promise in Romans 8. God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. In other words, this is a promise that applies to the believer, the one who has been transformed by God and is being conformed to the image of his son, as he says in verse 29. In other words, we cannot tell everyone that God always works things out for the good. Because that's not what the promise says. The promise says that God works all things for the good in the life of the believer, in the life of the Christian. But what God does promise us, that's what we need to focus on. What does God promise us here? He promises that in the life of the believer... He will work everything, and note the word all, together for the good. 
And the, the word for works for the good is a word from which we, which we get our English term, synergism. And this is the idea of various elements working together to perform an effect that is greater than and often completely different from the sum of each element acting separately. In other words, in the physical world, the right combination of otherwise harmful things, harmful chemicals, can produce substances that are extremely beneficial. For example, ordinary table salt is composed of two poisons. Think about a cake or some food items. On their own, many of the ingredients are distasteful and just seem to be useless. But when these things are combined together in the proper amounts, they produce something which is a delightful taste sensation. And this is a promise. God will take the pieces of our lives and combine them together into something that is beautiful. But thirdly and finally today, how does this knowledge change the way that we live? Well, it means that suffering is not futile. You know, there are times when we maybe feel that God is out to get us. Maybe we have in our lives wave after wave of difficulty that just seems to wash over us. And this promise reminds us that even though we may be in the furnace of life's difficulties, that God is using that furnace to refine us and purify us. And even though we may feel the blows of the hammer in difficult times, God is fashioning us into something that is beautiful and precious. And it also means that the best antidote to the times of suffering is trust. In the difficult, confusing and painful times, we are called to trust God. We must hold to his promises. We must rely on his character. I would encourage you today to, to memorize Romans 8, 28. Because it's going to be a verse that you will recall again and again. You will need it for your bad days. You will need it for your times of frustration. The times when you are confused and even in the times of devastation. Because when it comes down to it, faith really is pretty simple. You either trust God or you don't. And God's promise to us is that he will work with us even in the painful circumstances in our lives. And he will weave into something that is beautiful and that will help us grow in our relationship with him. That's how he works, weaving us into something that is beautiful, something that will grow, progress and develop in our relationship with him. And if you can hold on to his promise, this knowledge is a knowledge that will change your perspective on life. Amen. Let us all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.